Okay, well, Nick, thank you very much for the presentation today, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I suppose it would be really helpful if you just gave us uh, a review again of what you think the problems and challenges are that we're facing in this area. Well, um, I'm coming from the perspective uh, of being a liver doctor. So I'm a clinical liver doctor, I work at the liver unit at Southampton. And we've got a, a serious problem with liver disease, uh, which is largely a UK problem. So if you look at mortality rates from pretty much every disease you care to think of since the 1970s, they've all gone down. They've gone down between 20 and 70 percent. Uh, over the same period of time, mortality rates from liver disease have gone up fivefold, 500 percent. Um, that hasn't happened in Europe, where liver disease mortality has by and large gone down, particularly in the Mediterranean wine drinking countries. It has happened in Finland, which is another country where we've had the same level of deregulation of the drinks industry as we have seen in the UK uh, over that period of time. And the connection between the two is that around about 80% of mortality from liver disease is from alcohol related liver disease and around about 80% of the direct mortality from alcohol is from liver disease. So the two are intricately connected. And the reason that liver mortality has gone up so much in the UK is because as a nation our population level consumption of alcohol has gone up. Uh, and it's significantly gone up. That's not the only reason. The other main driver uh, for that increased consumption is that the affordability of alcohol has also gone up. In other words, alcohol is relatively much, much cheaper, about 300% cheaper than it was 20 years ago. And so what that means is that my patients who are at the really heavy drinking end of the spectrum, the average alcohol consumption of one of my patients with cirrhosis is 112 units a week, that's the equivalent of four bottles of vodka or ten or twelve bottles of wine. Uh, whereas 20 years ago that would have cost them a significant amount of money, now they get probably three times as many bangs for their buck. And therefore that proportion, that group in society who are drinking really heavily has increased dramatically and therefore we're seeing more liver disease. I think the talk very strongly established the significance of the problem. I suppose the next question is how can we think about tackling the harmful effects caused by alcohol consumption? Well, um, alcohol problems aren't new. Um, they've been with society for thousands of years. Uh, so uh, the Babylonians actually had laws against drink driving chariots. Uh, and the first mention of drunkenness that I've been able to find is in Gilgamesh, the epic Babylonian poem where the uh, uh, hero Enkidu encounters alcohol for the first time and gets completely drunk and has sex with a harlot and all sorts of bad things then happen to him. So, so we've been, as a society, we've had alcohol problems for a very, very long time. Um, we've also learned how to tackle alcohol-related problems at a policy level. There is a massive amount of evidence for the policies that work and the policies that don't work. And uh, essentially, the policies that work are the policies which regulate the things that industry uses to sell products and they're very very basic concepts. So these are basic fundamental concepts of marketing. So we've got something called the four P's which is price, place of sale, promotion and product. And effective alcohol policies are things that tackle those four P's of which the most effective and the most cost effective is to price, to put the relative price of alcohol up. In other words, to take us back to where we were before in terms of the relative price of alcohol. There have been other fundamental changes in our society in terms of alcohol in the UK. So perhaps the biggest one is the rise of supermarket sales of alcohol, heavily promoted alcohol, often sold as a loss leader in stores to drag people into stores to buy other products. So again, you go back a couple of decades, 70% of alcohol was bought in pubs. Uh, if you were going to drink alcohol at home you'd get a carry out from the pub or you might go to an off licence. Um, now 70% of alcohol is sold by supermarkets and it's not even sold in one place in a supermarket. You see stacks of cheap white wine stood around supermarkets. I've got a slide of one in the clothes aisle of a supermarket in Winchester. Um, it's, it's heavily promoted and it's sold cheaply and the business model is pilot high and sell it cheap and it's been very very successful. Promotion, there's been a massive change in the promotion of alcohol. If you go back to the 1970s, the classic alcohol advert, 
Um, uh, 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 I, I, I forget who it was now. I nominally face it, but you know, tipping Cinzano down the cleavage of a middle-aged woman. You know, it's selling martini and Cinzano now. Uh, the, the typical alcohol advert is aimed essentially at an 18-year-old. You know, that's 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 the market they're trying to drive. Um, so you add up all of those things together, and, and controlling those factors uh, are what would be effective alcohol policies. They're the same things that work for tobacco. Put up the price, challenge the promotions. You can't do very much about place of sale. I can't see us going back to the 1960s and stopping supermarkets selling alcohol, but you could at least make them sell alcohol in one part of the store. Okay. So, so far, so clear. You've identified a significant and rising health problem. You've identified alcohol's role in that problem. You've then identified a set of measures that we could take that would be a solution towards dealing with the problems of alcohol consumption. So, kind of the final naive question is, well, why aren't we doing this then? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I, think we, I think we have uh, reached a stage where, at the very least, governments are aware of the level uh, of problems that alcohol causes. Um, Jeremy Hunt announced a couple of weeks ago that he wanted to see the best levels of premature mortality uh, in Europe, you know, he wants to do something about avoidable deaths. Uh, well, if you look at the six leading causes of avoidable deaths, um, uh, uh, top is ischemic heart disease, then comes liver disease, surprisingly, and then you've got road accidents and suicides and breast cancer and lung cancer. Um, around about a, a third of those are alcohol related, less than a third are tobacco related. Alcohol causes more years of life lost prematurely in working age than tobacco does and a third are due to other causes. So this is, this is a really significant issue. The government recognised that. Uh, it has huge economic consequences. The cost uh, to society is probably of the order of somewhere between 20 and 40 billion pounds a year. The government recognises that as well. But what we have effectively is political uh, inertia in terms of being prepared to take the steps, the next steps. Now, uh, we're in a situation where not all of the UK is in the same boat. So north of the border in Scotland, where they have even more alcohol-related problems, uh, they're really taking the lead. So the Scottish National Party, uh, before they were in, in majority government, took on alcohol as an issue. They looked at the evidence. They came up with a very, very interesting and innovative solution for Scotland. Uh, and I was, I was on the committee that came up with this strategy, which is minimum unit pricing. Now that policy came about because Scotland had no direct tax levying powers for alcohol. So it was a workaround. Uh, yeah. It was how can we put the price of alcohol up even though we're not allowed to increase yeah. duty? And they said, yeah. well, we'll set a minimum unit price, which is what they've had in Canada for about 20 or 30 years. And initially, that's, that, that's what it was. But then they suddenly realised that actually, the problem with alcohol, certainly as far as liver disease is concerned, is my patients drinking huge amounts of alcohol, more than 100 units a week. As a result, they're spending huge, a huge proportion of their income, probably a medium of about 20% of their income, and they're buying the cheapest possible booze. This is cheap cider, two litres for two or three quid, the cheapest, cheapest spirits that you can buy. Super strong lagers that, frankly, nobody else drinks. You know, nobody else is drinking these things. And if you can take those out of the market, then you have a policy which is exquisitely targeted at, the, at, at those sections of society that, where, where the harm is concentrated. Unfortunately, they're up against a very, very, very powerful lobby from the drinks industry, and that lobby has been extremely effective and perfectly illustrated, I think, by the fact that David Cameron came out in favour of minimum unit pricing uh, over a year ago now, complete turnaround in, in, in uh, UK government policy, completely new strategy. They had to hand it to the Home Office to get it through because Andrew Lansley wasn't a supporter, and actually he then went from the Department of Health, but it's a Home Office strategy, even though it's largely around health. Um, but we've now seen the scenario over the last few months where, as a result of, uh, of media pressure, uh, uh, as a result, frankly, of untruths being told by certain sections of the drinks industry, um, we've had a political turnaround and we've had uh, a reversal of that policy led by you know, certain parts of the, of, of the Cabinet. So, you know, we're in a very, very difficult position. We're up against very, very powerful, very, very rich vested interests. 
um, and it's it's going to be a struggle to get effective policies through. I think. Well, thank you very much for uh, those answers, and uh, we just look forward to working with you more in the future, Nick. Thanks very much.